Hello and welcome to the Just and Center podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. Just a reminder, as always, that Justin Center as an organization is supported by donors. So we would ask if you have benefited from the things that we do here that you would consider becoming a regular contributor. You can go to justandcenter.org, go to our donate page there, and you can support us in all of our endeavors. Uh, now, today, it is about 85 degrees outside, and I have no air conditioning in this office, but uh, you are all so upset by one video that I recorded without my jacket that I put a jacket on for you all. All right, so if I, you know, sweat to death and pass out here, I'm blaming the audience. Okay, um, we are going to be jumping into the Augsburg Confession series that we have been doing as we've been looking at the various articles in the Augsburg Confession. We're really toward the end. <laughs> we're, we're toward the end, at least, of the, the chief doctrinal articles, and then we have the second section on the articles regarding church abuses that have happened in the medieval period, and I'm really, really wanting to get through the doctrinal section here. And once that's done, you have a good guide, hopefully, to the basics of the Lutheran faith that you can watch. You can watch this as a series. Somebody who doesn't know much about doctrine or specifically Lutheran doctrine, who just kind of wants to learn where we're coming from, what our history is, they can watch from beginning to end of the series and get all of the basics together. So we're really, really close at this point, and I really want to get this done. Uh, right now, we are on article number 17 on Christ's return to judgment. Just a reminder of the text that we are using. This is the edition of the Augsburg Confession that we put out with Justin Center Publications, jspublishing.org. And this is Charles Kraut's edition, uh, which has a really great historical introduction and notes throughout. Um, you can find all sorts of editions of the Augsburg Confession if you have a copy of the whole Book of Concord. It's in there. Um, but if you want to check out the Kraut edition, you can go to jspublishing.org. And that is what I am reading from. So that is the text that we are working from here. And now we are on the question of uh, the return of Christ. So we've gotten to the section on eschatology or, or last things. This and I, and I will say it is kind of interesting in, in terms of the ordering of a lot of these articles that we see uh, in the Augsburg Confession. As you go through the general ordering of you know topics of doctrine, you generally start with the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, and then you talk about the doctrine of man, sin. And, and we've talked about the purposeful ordering of these various articles because as you read through these various articles, they really do build on each other. And generally, what would you would expect to be kind of the last article would be last things, right? Eschatology, because it's the study of last things, the final things, the return of Christ, um, the renewal of heavens and the earth, and final judgment, and all of those ideas. So generally, that would show up at the end, but it doesn't show up at the end here. And, uh, you know, I, I've wondered why that's the case in the Augsburg Confession, that it doesn't show up there uh, at the very end. And I think this is the reason, <laughs> okay? I think this is the reason is that when we get to the next questions, uh, we have the topic of free will, um, on the cause of sin, and then good works, and then the worship of saints. Those articles are largely clarifications, clarifications of previous articles. And you know we know from documentation that we have, at least in terms of Melanchthon's contribution, and he's the major writer of the Augsburg Confession here, that he wanted to clarify specifically with the following two articles on free will and the cause of sin, some misunderstandings of Luther's doctrine of the bondage of the will, as we find in books like The Bondage of the Will. Uh, and, and so it seems like the, this article was kind of the final of the main articles, and then added on to that at the end were some clarifications. And so the final articles really clarify doctrines or topics that were already talked about, but just get more in depth on some particulars. And, and so they're really important, specifically anticipating some Roman Catholic objections that are going to be held toward the Augsburg Confession. And they were, by the way. I mean, as we, we have a response to the Augsburg Confession, which then results in the apology, and the response is not generally well received. It's not a good document. Uh, nobody really thinks so. I mean, Roman Catholics don't think it was a good document either. There are much more robust defenses uh, of, of Rome against the, the reformers. 
Uh, so that is the reason uh, where why Christ's return to judgment appears at this point, and there are some articles that follow this, as those are more clarification articles. So let's talk about Christ's return to uh, to judgment. We're, I'm going to read uh, part one here, and then we'll read two and three as we move on, but we're going to start just with part one. It says this, also they teach that in the consummation of the world, uh, which we then have a clarification from Krauth, he says at the last day, so the, if you don't know what consummation means, Christ shall appear to judge and shall raise up all the dead and shall give unto the godly and elect eternal life, everlasting joys, but ungodly men and the devils shall he condemn unto endless torments. All right, so let's go through this piece by piece. There's a lot we could talk about here, probably more than you, you think of, because this is a relatively brief article, but uh, in this relatively brief description here, there, there are a lot of assumptions. Uh, there are a lot of errors that are criticized, and that is errors in the past, but also errors of today that still exist in, in various groups. So let's talk about what the consummation means. So we see the the last day, uh, as Krauth you know defines for us here, is is described as the consummation. So what is the consummation of the world? Why that particular language? Well, it, it's often been the case that when people kind of summarize the biblical narrative, they speak about a fourfold, uh, you know, kind of levels of or times of redemption, uh, fourfold periods in redemptive history. Uh, it starts with creation, and then we have the fall, then we have redemption, and then consummation. So these these four states relate to something we've talked about before, which is the four states of, of man's will. And think about, for example, in at the moment of creation, we have Adam prior to the fall. You know, Adam and Eve prior to the fall were capable of obeying God's law without sinning at all. Uh, they, they could have obeyed in perfect righteousness and holiness and not committed any error. We're told in the text of scripture that they were created to be very good. And they had the possibility, however, of sinning. Then we have the situation of the fall. After the fall, we have humans are now in bondage to sin, which means we cannot do anything but sin. We can do things that are civically righteous, sure. So we can do things that are externally good by human natural powers in terms of remnants of righteousness that are left after the fall, but we cannot do anything which is actually spiritually good because as St. Paul tells us, anything that is done without faith is sin, and the natural man, because of the fall, is in a state where faith is impossible apart from supernatural grace. So we have a state where man can do nothing but sin. Then we have uh, the time of redemption. Christ redeems us, those who are the redeemed people of God. We can make decisions for righteousness, but we cannot live totally without sin as Adam could in the garden prior to the fall because we still have the sinful nature clinging to us. And then we have the final age of the consummation when God's people are made perfectly righteous so that we freely do God's will and we are not actually capable at all of sinning at that point. Uh, our, our natures have been totally renewed. The old sinful flesh is gone. We have participated in the resurrection. We are brand new creatures. So at that point, sin itself is an impossibility for God's creatures. So that's what we have with the, the consummation. So we go through this period of creation, fall, redemption, consummation. And we can kind of break up all of uh, really the, the stories of scripture and the, the narrative of scripture into those various categories. Of course, the fall for the first few chapters of Genesis, and then in chapter three, we get we get the fall. Um, and after the fall, we have redemption immediately offered uh, in Genesis three. So immediately after the fall, we have redemption beginning. So we go from fall to redemption. Well, we go to, from creation to fall pretty quickly and then fall to redemption very quickly as well. Um, but then everything is building toward the consummation. So the consummation is the, the consummation of all things, which is the, the final end goal, the telos. So this is what all of our faith, all of our life, all of creation, everything is pointing forward to an end goal. So the Christian faith is eschatologically oriented, meaning that the Christian faith is oriented toward the end. It's, it's oriented toward the future because we are in an age of sin. And we are are waiting for the return of our Lord to to correct and fix all things. Um, so we have a, an eschatologically oriented faith, and that's why this shows up in the creeds. We're constantly talking about last things. We're constantly talking about the the age that is to come. Um, the scripture gives us this dichotomy between this age and the age that is to come. Uh, 
Jesus does this at several points. For, uh, think, for example, of the, the, the time where Jesus is asked about, about marriage, who one will be married to in, in heaven, if someone has a spouse and then they die, and then another spouse, which one are they married to in the age to come? Uh, Jesus makes this dichotomy between this age and the age to come. The age to come will not be like this age because there will be no marriage. No one will be given in marriage um, in, in the age to come because the age to come differs from, from this present age. And, and you have that division in Paul's theology is pretty significantly as well. So everything is pointing forward to that age to come. And that consummation, as we are told in this article of the Augsburg Confession, is the consummation of the world. Now, that's pretty key as well. I think we, it, when you're doing practical just pastoral ministry in a congregation to people who maybe aren't particularly theologically educated and probably aren't spending their time listening to theology podcasts or watching theology videos on YouTube like you are right now. Um, <laughs> it is often the case that people come with this understanding of heaven, that heaven is this kind of escape from the physical world, so that heaven is escape from the body, but heaven is also escape from the world. And this comes, I think, more from popular culture than it does actually from the scriptural text itself. Um, and now, <clears throat> to be clear, um, there is now there are a couple different views uh, of what happens after death prior to the resurrection. Okay, and one of those views is this idea of soul sleep. Uh, soul sleep basically says that the the kind of state that we are in after the death of the physical body and before the resurrection, that is a stage of essentially unawareness. Like we, we're not aware of anything really happening until the resurrection. So if you were to die today, you would essentially experience the resurrection immediately because you'd be sleeping basically through the rest of it. Now, I think the, the doctrine of soul sleep, um, there, there are actually some arguments that Luther held to the doctrine of soul sleep. Um, I don't necessarily think that he did, but I think there there are some statements that could be read that way in Luther. Um, but I certainly don't think it's biblical. Um, the, the The reason is there is scripturally an immediacy to one's uh, one's reception into the presence of God. Okay, Jesus says to the thief on the cross, you know, today you will be with me in paradise. There, there's an immediacy that. Even prior, the resurrection day hasn't happened yet. Jesus' resurrection hasn't even happened yet. Yet he is with him in paradise. Um, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul says, uh, so that and there, there's being absent from the body and present with the Lord. There, there seems to be, I think, an awareness of the soul that is in in the presence of God. Uh, we are also told that there are martyrs uh, that are there under the altar and the heavenly altar in the book of Revelation who are watching what's going on on this earth, meaning they have awareness after death and prior to final resurrection. So I think the doctrine of soul sleep is just really not a biblically founded one. Some people try to argue for it. Specifically, they're trying to argue against, uh, I think too strongly, against the, the Gnostic notion that the soul's goal is to kind of escape from the body, and and they rightly want to emphasize the physicality of humanity, this idea that God created his world to be material, to be physical. It's not bad to be physical, and redemption does not mean escape from physicality. We are physical creatures. Jesus, even glorified, retains his human nature. And if the second person of the triune Godhead has assumed a human nature and retains that human nature throughout the rest of eternity, it can't be a bad thing to have a physical body. Uh, so God created us as physical creatures, and it's also good to be a creature. Uh, we, we don't need to try to escape to be gods or something. We, we, we have these creaturely bodies, and God made us to be creatures, and that's good. We're good creatures uh, because we are created by a good God who desires us to serve in a particular function in his the universe. Uh, so having a physical body is a good thing. And and that having of the physical body extends beyond just the physical self into creation. Uh, so we're told, for example, in, in Romans chapter 8, that all of creation groans. All of creation groans with longing for the revelation of the sons of God. In other words, there is something that is, that is cosmic, truly cosmic about redemption. That when we're talking about redemption, it is not just a redemption of individual souls, but there is this 
broader reality that our individual souls are part of, but that broader reality is creation itself. I mean, the, the scripture begins with God's act of creation, this creating this physical world, and scripture ends with the creation of a new heavens and new earth. So, the goal is redemption, ultimately, of the cosmos, redemption of all things, redemption of the world, so that there is a, a massive redemption that goes far beyond just us as individuals it, that extends to the entire created universe. Now, there are also some different ways uh, to explain how that occurs as well. And within Lutheran history, both views have generally been allowed at different points. And these views are, we, we can divide these views between one that says that this physical creation will literally be destroyed and God will then make a new creation that is totally new, that is a greater creation, will kind of do it over, something like a new Genesis 1, but this time he's, he's done it in a, in a perfect way so that there is no fall uh, or corruption tied to this creation. And, and the second view says that there is a, a recreation of this earth. So creation is, this recreation is not total and absolute, right? So that when the final day comes, when Christ returns, this whole earth will be renewed rather than totally destroyed. So those are, are, are the kind of two options that are on the table. And throughout the history of the Lutheran Church, we've got both of those as viable options. There are debates about this. So in other words, when you're looking at the Augsburg Confession or the rest of our Articles of Faith, this is not an issue that is, that is clearly taught on. Um, there is room for a variance of perspectives on exactly how this works, and, and that's okay. So we, as much as we do have confessions of faith that get pretty particular about certain doctrines, we do leave some room for disagreement on some particulars, and that's one of these areas where we have some disagreement. And I think there's a, there's a reason why there's there's such disagreement uh, when we're talking about the the kind of recreation of all things. Uh, we're essentially speaking about a select number of passages. Um, we have Matthew 24, uh, where we have Jesus talking about the end of all things. We have uh, Second Peter, where he describes the, the earth as being destroyed by fire. And then we have the new heavens and new earth as described in the book of Revelation. And it's not that there are no other texts, because there are plenty of texts that talk about the consummation, but those are going to be the kind of key debated texts. And if you think about the, the imagery of fire that's used in Peter, we can kind of see how how these two different readings both exist. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll just look at that passage in, in Peter real quick. Okay, so this is Second Peter uh, chapter 3, starting in, uh, well, we'll just, yeah, I guess we can just read verse 10 here. Um, now we'll read through 12. So, you know, and, and I, I know I'm kind of just broad overviewing scripture here, scripture there, but that's kind of the nature of this, this study is I want to hit the main topics without delving deep into each of the texts or debates related to this, because I know we could do that and it would take us a lot longer to get through this. <laughs> I'm trying to get through this as, as fast as I can, but nonetheless. Okay, so let's let's at least read this text from Second Peter so you kind of understand where these views both come from. It says uh, in verse 10, but the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord is a phrase coming from the Old Testament prophets that refers to this final great day, this this day of judgment, the day of consummation is often referred to as the day of the Lord. Um, sometimes in the prophets, you'll see the phrase, the day of the Lord has reference to a couple different things. Uh, so it could be, it, and this is kind of just how typology works, is that you have prophetic passages that sometimes have a final fulfillment, which is the final day of the Lord. And there are little kind of pictures of days, little days of the Lord, which prefigure that final day of the Lord. And those happen through, say, the kind of exile of Israel. Uh, we see this through the destruction of the temple in 70 AD or at various other points. But the day of the Lord passages point to one final day of the Lord, which is the return of, of Jesus, the day of consummation as we're talking about here. So the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Pretty key. This is repeatedly stated throughout scripture that we are not to try to figure out the day or the hour when Christ is going to return, when the consummation is going to happen. So we don't need to listen to the herald campings of the world who try to use very bizarre mathematics to try to 
figure out a date when Jesus is returning, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Uh, that nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Okay, so there, there's a passage which is very clear about this this final day and what's going on. So um, it's clear that there is some kind of pretty destructive activity that involves fire upon this earth, and the result of that is a, a new heavens and new earth. So the question is, what does this mean? What is the nature of that new heavens and new earth? Is it totally new, or is this fire kind of changing the old and destroying the sinful while some parts of this earth remain as part of this new heavens and new earth. Um, so, you know, I can kind of understand, honestly, pretty well both perspectives, and I think there's decent arguments for, for both. Um, but the, the one that would say that there's a total destruction would point to, like, the language of melting, dissolving. The, the language does at times here in, in Peter. It can certainly at least give the impression of a kind of total destruction. Uh, but the other argument says, well, we're, think about what we're talking about here, which is fire. Now, fire does destroy, and there certainly is language of destruction here, but fire also refines. So fire is that which does melt and destroy the, the sinful things of the earth, but also can purify. So perhaps the reason why the imagery of fire is used is because Peter's trying to get across this notion of a purification of this earth. And, and that's the perspective that, that I take. Uh, to be honest, this text alone, um, I, I think I'd be pretty undecided if this was all that we had, because I, I could see it pretty easily going both ways. The, the reason why I take that perspective is simply taking into account a lot of other biblical themes that it just seems to fit better in terms of what we see throughout Scripture. Uh, so, there, there are two essential reasons, things that would be taken into consideration here. First is the flood. Now, the flood is, the, the Noahic flood is kind of the first recreation of the earth. We see that there is wickedness has gotten so great that all of the thoughts of men's hearts are only evil continually, we're told in Genesis 6. So, things have gotten so bad that God basically starts over. So, there is this new creation. God uses the element of water to recreate. Again, water is something else that has certainly cleansing power, but also destructive power, like in a flood. So, just like fire. And so, we have this kind of first new creation, which is pre-flood po to post-flood world. If that is a type, then, of the recreation of the heavens and the earth, it makes more sense to see the same kind of pattern, though in a fuller way, so that there is, like in the flood, a cleansing of wickedness off the earth but not a total destruction of the earth. Uh, the, the other reason is simply that the pattern that we see throughout scripture is, is one of redemption, like with human bodies. You know, Je Jesus' body died and then his body was raised. It's not like he received a totally different body and that his old body was still in the tomb. I mean, the resurrection is, the empty tomb is a kind of a key part of this whole picture. Uh, and so we're talking about the resurrection of the body, the physical body, it's corrupt. Uh, you know, as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15, there is the difference between the, the fleshly body and then the uh, the spiritual body that, that one has. And so the general pattern of physical bodies is that the sinful parts are gone, but there is a renewal of the same body in a new way, such that it's called, still called a new body, right? We are new creations in Christ. As Paul says to the Corinthians, when, we, when we're new creations and regeneration, that doesn't mean that that the old sin, the, that there's no continuity between who I was and who I am now. I'm still the same person, but I'm so radically changed by the grace of God that I am have this new identity that I can be called a new creation. But it's really redemption rather than a total destruction and recreation. So because that's the biblical pattern in many other ways, it it seems to just fit that it's that this would be the pattern with the physical earth as well. So that's the perspective I take, but. Again, there, there's variance here. The Augsburg Confession isn't explicit on one of those views over the other. So there's some room for debate here. But the important thing to note is that final redemption in the consummation does not just include 
individual souls or even individual human souls and bodies, but it includes the entirety of the created cosmos. Okay, maybe the, the, and the, the next thing that maybe is important to talk about here is that Christ appears as judge. And so Christ appears to judge and shall raise up all the dead, shall give unto the godly and the elect eternal life and everlasting joys, but the ungodly men and devils shall he condemn to endless torments. So let's talk about what it means that Christ appears as judge. Now, this, this is a very important scriptural theme that, that Jesus is the judge. Uh, because generally we're going to think of all judgment being the judgment of, of God, and specifically we probably think of the Father, but the Father has granted all judgment to the Son. Uh, we can look at, if you want to watch my program I did on, on the Doctrine of Inseparable Operations, I get into that in some, in some detail. But Scripture repeatedly talks about this judgment being delivered to the Son, so that the Son, Christ, stands in the place of the Father with all complete authority. And that authority is a divine authority that he uses. So language about Christ as final judge is really language about the divinity of Christ because we are saying that th this is a, being a judge at the final judgment. This is a divine role for sure. I mean, read through the Old Testament prophets about this last day. This is, this is certainly God's day. <laughs> like God is the one active here. So the fact that this judgment is worked through the Son or granted to the Son means that this is a divine figure that we're talking about here. Now, it's also uh, important to think about the Reformation context here as we are continually talking about what's going on historically during the, the confessions as well as what the scriptural testimony says. So if we're thinking about Christ as judge, the medieval church really got that Christ was judge. If you look at you know medieval altarpieces, oftentimes, and I love medieval altarpieces, I really do. I mean, I love medieval art more than most things. Uh, but but a lot of medieval altarpieces have Christ as judge, kind of at right at the center, right? This is the center. You often have these these paintings that have um, a number of biblical events, but oftentimes centered around final judgment where you have the wicked on one side and the righteous on the other, and you'll have, you know, saints of the Old Testament and New Testament and throughout history, and then you'll have all of the, you know, Judas and all of the other bad people uh, here. But there was such a centrality upon the final judgment in the medieval period in art, uh, in, in performances as well. You have these plays that kind of that go from town to town where, you know, it's a society that is largely illiterate, uh, and in, in, in a society that's not that literate, you know, peasants, how are you going to learn about the stories of Scripture? Well, you're going to see pictures and you're going to watch um, plays that are that are performed, illustrating certain aspects of, of the biblical narrative, or you're going to hear songs that talk about biblical events. Uh, but you can't just like pick up a Bible and read it. So it's going to be a little, your, your, your view of things is going to be shaped by the imagery that you see. As as is the case of with anybody, because that's how we function as creatures that see and hear things. Um, we don't function just based on pure logical reasoning processes through getting a logical deduction of what is correct according to a particular text. Uh, well, not that we shouldn't do that, but but we're we're physical, sensory creatures as well, and that's that's a good thing. That's part of our nature. So when you have the centrality of the final judgment. And specifically, you see Christ at the final judgment, and you see the fires of hell, you can often see Christ primarily through the lens as judge rather than savior and redeemer. And it's, it's been argued by historians, many historians, that the reason why the, the rise in Mariology occurs in the Middle Ages is because of the the significant emphasis on Christ as judge, specifically as related to the possibility of hell, that Christ becomes this kind of scary figure because he's my judge. He's terrifying. And when you think of Christ, you think of him as one who's going to punish you. And certainly there is that picture of Christ in the New Testament. I mean, look at the book of Revelation. He's kind of terrifying. He's got like these glowing you know, eyes and he's so bright you can't look at him and he's got all authority in heaven and on earth is his. And so you can kind of understand why that would be the case, especially if you're not really hearing about the love of God as shown on the cross. So when that's the case, 
people start to then look for someone like Mary who is kinder, someone who can kind of mediate between you and the ju the harsh judge. You can go kind of through his mother. And so we, we have to be, I think, aware when we're speaking about Christ in his role of judgment that we don't look to Christ primarily as judge, right? So we, we have these two aspects of the life of the life of Christ. We have his coming in his humiliation, where he came to give his life for sinners. He came to give his life for all sinners, every single one of us, every man, woman, child who's ever lived. He came to give himself for us through his death on the cross. And on the cross, he paid the penalty for all of our sins. He took our debt upon himself. He set us free in the resurrection uh, from the powers of evil that bound us and gives us the promise of resurrection. And, and that's primarily where the church looks, right? This is primarily where the church needs to look. This is how we encounter Christ. We encounter him through the cross. We encounter him and his love that he has for us, which is granted to us in the word of God, in the sacraments of holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. So this is why we have crucifixes everywhere in our sanctuaries, because at the cross, we see the one who we are gathered to worship and to receive. We receive his gifts and we see him crucified uh, for us. But none of that negates the reality that Christ is indeed judge. Christ is judge. And this is really a matter of proclaiming law and gospel and the proper proclamation of law and gospel. So that when we, when people are in the midst of sin, uh, when they are not repentant, uh, when individuals are refusing faith, at that point, they do need to hear not about Christ as Savior, but Christ as judge. And they do need to hear about the reality that Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead and all authority in heaven and on earth is his. And he will condemn. And when one is repentant, they need to hear Christ the Savior, right? They need to hear about Christ and his humiliation, who, though he is judge and has authority and power over all things, gave that up in his human nature in order to serve us and to give his life for us. So it's a proper application here of law and gospel, which is when you proclaim judgment and Christ's role as judge, and then Christ's role as mediator and savior. And ultimately, if you look at something like the book of Revelation that talks all about God's judgment on the wicked through Christ and, and his seat on the judgment throne, the purpose of Revelation really is more than just talking about judgment, comfort for the church. So the purpose of Revelation is really to say, the one who has redeemed you is also judge over the universe. I mean, think specifically about what's going on in the church at the end of the first century, where you have uh, persecution rising. You have Nero's persecution. And after that, and of course you could debate when Revelation's written, because I know some people have a very early understanding of when Revelation was written, but I tend to have the more common view that it was written in the 90s around 90-ish AD. Um, but regardless, persecution had started when John's writing Revelation. So in, in the, this, to this degree, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and I think most of the arguments that Revelation is so early are really dependent upon a particular um, conviction that a lot of Revelation is about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So if that's the case, it's got to be before 70 AD. I don't take that perspective. I'm not a preterist. Um, so I don't have to have the, the early dating. And I think that's the main reason people take the early dating. Um, but I don't know. Who knows? I, maybe I'm wrong on that. I, I don't know. Uh, and it doesn't really matter that much <laughs> to me right now. Okay. So um, the okay. So we're, <laughs> the book of Revelation is, uh, I think, written to it, not in 90 or so AD. But regardless of when it's written, it's written during a period of Christian persecution. And it's showing that ultimately... The kingdom of Rome, the persecutors, the ones who are now attacking the church and destroying the church, who may make the church look like it is hopeless and we're doomed. That is a kingdom that's going to be defeated by King Jesus. So whatever earthly kings set themselves up against the church and try to destroy the church, King Jesus will destroy them. He has victory over those powers of evil and the powers of darkness. 
And that ultimately is supposed to be a message of comfort to the church to say, though these people may look like they have the upper hand right now, they don't. Jesus is on the throne right now. And throughout the book of Revelation, we get these images of, we, we get interspersed throughout these scenes of what's going on on the earth and the craziness on the earth, is then, then in between those scenes, we have these heavenly throne room scenes. And throughout these heavenly throne room scenes is, you know, I've described this as kind of just pulling the curtain back. So it's like you see you see the, the play, right? But you don't see everything that's going on behind the scenes, but that needs to happen for everything in front to happen. The curtain's just hiding all of that. So that's what's going on here in, in our history now is if you pull the curtain back and all the craziness that's happening on the earth, as John shows us in Revelation, what you see is Jesus on the throne. What you see is saints and angels bowing before him, worshiping him. He is the king. He is the Lord. He is in control of all things. He has the keys over death and hell. So that in the midst of persecution, the church can look to Christ and say, he's king. Regardless of what's going on with our earthly rulers and whatever arrogance they have, Psalm 2 tells us that the God who's in the heavens, he laughs. Right? He laughs at them because he's, he's got the power. He's got the authority, ultimately. Not us. Not our silly earthly kings that try to fight against him. Um, so I, th I think it's important to keep all of that in mind as we're talking about Christ as judge, the context in which we, this teaching comes and the context in which we, we talk about this, because it doesn't mean that God's people need to be just frightened of Jesus all the time. That's what happens at the time of the Reformation, and Luther's like terrified of Christ because he sees him as this, this judge that's just going to be angry at him every time he messes up, instead of seeing him as advocate, mediator, redeemer, and savior. Um, then we have uh, described here that... Um, the that Jesus as judge, he shall raise up all the living and the dead. So Jesus is going to to raise all from death, which means that resurrection is something that actually occurs for all people. Everyone is resurrected. There's no one who's not resurrected. So the righteous and the wicked are both both experience this resurrection from the dead. But some are risen unto eternal life. Others are brought to eternal death. So. Eternal life and eternal death are both realities that are, in essence, bodily. Okay, so this, this again goes to what we're talking about with, with the cosmos, but related to our physical bodies, is there is a confession here that salvation includes not just the soul, but the body. Okay, and in various, you know, Gnostic movements, but not just Gnosticism. This is true in a lot of ancient religions and contemporary religions as well. You know, think about Empire Strikes Back when Yoda pokes Luke and says, not this crude matter are we, right? We're luminous beings. Uh, that You know, matter is bad. We are not purely physical beings. And I hate to disagree with Yoda, you know, but, but he's wrong here. Uh, and so we are in, in a Gnostic view, we are just our kind of spiritual souls. We are not our bodies. Our bodies basically hinder us. So our bodies, for, for a Gnostic perspective, um, the body kind of causes various limitations. And for the Gnostics, the goal of redemption is to escape the physical body, not the resurrection of the body. And so the body limits us and, you know, the body gets sick and all this other stuff, and it limits how many places we can be at once, and we get tired, and we can't do all the things we want to do. But if you're free from the body, you're free to do whatever the heck you want. You can just kind of float around, and you have all sorts of powers and abilities or whatever. So in a Gnostic approach, the goal of redemption, then, is to learn how to escape from the body. And this often shows itself in practice in a kind of uh, renunciation of the body, the renunciation of the physical, looking at the physical things as if they're all really bad. We got to get away from the bad physical stuff. But the Christian doctrine of creation says that no, the body is actually good. The goal isn't to escape your body. God wants you to be a bodily being because he made your body. So it's good. Now we have fallen bodies. So because of the fall, we have bodies that are subject to decay we have bodies that are subject to corruption. And, you know, is it true that we won't have as many limitations on our bodies in the resurrection? Yeah, it seems to be the case. But it doesn't mean we're not bodily creatures. So 
it, it is wrong to say then that the body is simply this kind of thing that we got to carry around for a while that we just want to get away from. We've got issues with our bodies because we have the fall, but the goal is not the destruction of the body, um, but the Christian goal is the resurrection of the body so that the, the physical self will function how it was supposed to function in the first place, but it will still be physical. Okay, so the Christian doctrine of the resurrection says that we, to be whole beings, we are body and soul. Now, again, as we talked about this doctrine of soul sleep, and I think that's rejected scripturally, we, we do have souls that can exist without our bodies. You can be a soul without a body for a time, but it, it's, it's not who you should be. Right? It's, not, it's not you and your fullness. It's not who you're meant to be. So th- it's kind of like having, you know, it's like you're, think of yourself being alive, but you've lost all of your limbs and you're, you know, on a ventilator and can't move or do anything. Like it's still you, but you're not at your full potential. You're not where you want to be or what you're meant to be or do. So that's the way it is to be the soul without the body. And, and I'm sure that there's, you know, bliss for the soul better than, you know, being on a ventilator and sick in a hospital. But, um, but you're, there's still something missing, right? That's, that's why these martyrs on the altar in Revelation say, how long, O Lord? They're still waiting, even though they're in the presence of God without, as, as souls, uh, and they're jo- enjoying the presence of God, there's still something that's missing, right? There's still something that, that they're waiting for, and that is the final consummation, which includes the resurrection of the body. So the Christian goal is always, is always the resurrection of the body, um, so that their redemption is, is physical. Now, to be clear, what we want to avoid the modern materialist view, because now you have these kind of Christian physicalists, as they call themselves, who believe that the human person is nothing but a physical body who say that there is no such thing as the material soul. And they'll go to Genesis 1 and say man has become a living soul. Nefesh means basically just something having to do with the physical body, not a separate thing, um, which certainly doesn't work in any sense with the New Testament texts that should interpret how we view those things in the Old Testament. But um, actually, uh, Widener, if you want to read a good treatment of this, Widener's anthropology has a fantastic treatment of the question of the soul, the relationship between body and soul in the Old and New Testaments. It's, it's excellent. So highly, highly recommend that. Um, it's, it's very thorough. It's very thorough. So if, you know, the Christian physicalists would say that all we are is a physical body, and that's the modern materialist atheist view of the human self, that there is nothing soulish about us at all, that we are just physical things. We don't have f- even free will in any sense at all. Um, our, our biology just determines our every action and everything that we say and everything that we do, uh, that there are no thoughts that are distinct from just goings on in the brain. They are identical. We are our brains or we are our physical bodies. Uh, and we could talk about theories of the mind in, in modern philosophy and why they fall short, but that's the modern physicalist view. Now, I heard a very popular Christian speaker talk about this, who is uh, part of Biologos. Um, and I saw a, a talk that, that he did, and I had a chance to talk to him some. Um, well, I guess I could say, I mean, his name is, is uh, Praveen. He's a Praveen, uh, oh, what is his last name? He's here at Cornell. So we, we've had some interaction. Uh, he probably wouldn't remember who I was, but I've been to a couple of his talks and we've talked a little bit. Um, but he's, uh, he's a, a biologist, a Christian, and um, tries to make the argument essentially that we are just physical beings, that the scriptural account is not that different from the modern materialist account, which I think is just so wildly incorrect exegetically, but I also find it to be um, not just exegetically inadequate, but I also find it to be philosophically far behind where we are these days. <laughs> like, like it, it's kind of depending upon a very naive materialist philosophy of mind that's just kind of inconceivable with a lot of the questions that have been raised today. And I understand why naturalists and atheists, you know, they, they have to essentially hold on to some of those ideas. But as a Christian, I don't understand why you would try to do that. So I, I just find it very weak exegetically. Um, J.P. Moreland has some good work dealing with Christian physicalism if you want to dive further into that. I think he's got some really, really good critiques. So we want to avoid both of those errors, right? So the one error is to say that we are just 
souls and we want to escape the body and the body is bad. And that's what you find in ancient Gnosticism. But then on the other hand, you have this view that says all we are is physical bodies and that there is no immaterial soul. We want to project that as well. Okay, so the, the Christian eschatology and Christian anthropology comes somewhere between those two perspectives to say, no, we are both body and soul. And those are both essential to how God has made us to be. And uh, in our, our at the final day, final judgment, uh, we will um, be raised as body and soul. Okay, so then we have a mention here that this, this uh, eternal life is given to the godly and elect. Uh, so just a quick, quick mention there, the note of the term elect. In Lutheran theology, when we use the term elect, we are referencing only those who are finally saved. Okay, so um, the elect are only those who are actually finally totally saved. Uh, the elect is election is not just a universal category that refers to all people who Christ died for. Um, so it's not another name for universal grace. There is a particularity in the term election that it is a reference to only those who are finally saved. Um, now, that doesn't make us Calvinists, because then we have the, the question, well, why are some elect and others not elect? And the only reason for one's non-election is because they have re resisted God's grace. Okay, But the only reason that those elect are saved is because God has saved them by his grace, not because of any decision that they had made. But we're not going to get into the details of that question. Just a quick note in terms of how the term elect is being used here. At, that doesn't happen until the formula of Concord that we get some more extensive explanation of, of that issue. All right, so he gives eternal life and everlasting joys to those, but to the ungodly men and the devils he shall condemn to endless torment. So we do have here an affirmation of the reality of hell. Okay, so we have the Lutheran confessions do affirm the reality of hell. There is actual punishment for the wicked. And this is certainly something that's hard. You know, it's not like I haven't had my own existential struggles over these questions of people going to hell and, and suffering punishment. It's hard. And, and I don't think that we are, I don't think that we are called scripturally to, you know, rejoice in hell or to celebrate the reality of hell. I'm not a double predestinarian Calvinist. I think that, you know, when people like Paul Washer say that, you know, if your own child is going to hell, you'd be cheering God on to punish him forever. I just don't buy that at all. I don't think that's how we are ever told to look at those who are in hell. Um, so there is justice. There is eternal justice. There is justice that is that is punishment. Um, but the overwhelming message of scripture is that God desires the salvation of all. God does not delight in the death of the wicked. Uh, God does not desire punishment. Uh, the way that Luther would talk is, is he says that God's alien work is God's judgment or wrath against sin. That's God's alien work. God's proper work is salvation. Like this is what God does. God is the one who saves. He does judge evil. So we can't ignore that reality. But we aren't to have some kind of delight in people going to hell. I mean, we... we we want all to know Christ. We want all to know his love and his grace. We want all to find him, be saved, receive salvation, repent, all of those things. Um, is there a sense in which we can delight in, in justice being done? Yeah. I mean, it, it, we should, we can celebrate earthly justice being done. Um, we can celebrate God being just for sure, but we don't rejoice in the fact that people are suffering. But there is a reality of, of final judgment, and this is something that I think is um, very hard to avoid in the biblical text. There have been proposals otherwise throughout the history of the church. There have been a couple different proposals, and, and that's what the Augsburg Confession brings up here, so let's just read the rest of this section. Uh, they condemn the Anabaptists who think that to condemn to men and devils, that shall be the end of the torments. So, and then we have a question I want to address after this, and I know we're kind of getting close to our time here, so I'll try to go quickly. But the the Anabaptists had a perspective that said, which, which is known today as as annihilationism. So this idea that that hell is not uh, eternal, uh, that hell does it exist, that there is destruction, there is judgment, but it's not eternal. So that it's a kind of immediate destruction of the wicked, 
and only the righteous are those who survive. So they're basically just annihilated. And the biblical reasoning for this is that there is a lot of imagery that is imagery of destruction that is used in terms of final judgment and punishment. It is used repeatedly throughout throughout Scripture. And so the argument is, well, maybe this destruction language is to be taken more literally, and they literally are destroyed. They cease to exist. Um, it does solve some kind of moral problems or questions that people have to say it seems more, more right um, that they wouldn't be tortured forever, especially being tortured forever for having a temporal sin for a temporary time on this earth. It has answers to questions of things like, well, how can Jesus take the uh, eternal punishments of sin at just a moment upon himself on the cross if humans have to suffer eternally and they can't just take it upon themselves in a moment? That's some of the arguments. Now, there are responses to all of these arguments, by the way, uh, but I'm just presenting the reason why people come to, to some of these conclusions. So it sounds nice um, to be able to say, okay, well, the punishments come to an end. And the, the question really comes down to a, s a series of texts that, and, and I would get into these if I had more time, um, but to, to kind of boil down where the debate stems, it's the question of Ionios, uh, which is like talking about th something being uh, eternal or, or for a long time, that hell is referred to at, with that term. And some would say that, well, it doesn't have to mean eternity. It can mean just a long period of time or a period of time because an ion is, is an age, right? Um, now, I would grant that, that is, that's correct uh, in terms of the just usage of the term more broadly, but the question, the, the thing that I think fails in those arguments is the parallels that we have throughout Scripture. And there, we see this in in the words of Jesus and in the book of Revelation, between the everlasting nature of eternal life and the everlasting nature of punishment. They, they are these kind of exact parallels. So to say that the term in one context, or for in terms of eternal life, is really eternal, but then in terms of eternal death is not eternal, I think it's a hard sell to try to argue that exegetically. And I think that the arguments for it tend not to be exegetically driven as much as they are driven by a lot of moral dilemmas and questions. The, there is another position that you find uh, in, in Origin and more recently in, in David Bentley Hart's uh, work on this subject, um, which I didn't find compelling at all. But there, this other argument says that there is a punishment, uh, but it also leads to eventual redemption. So that there's this kind of temporary punishment, but eventually all people will be redeemed. So that uh, there, an origin believed that right this that even the devils themselves they would be punished for a time, and that eventually they would be redeemed. They would be made new, and a lot of the arguments here come from the very universal cosmic kind of redemption text that we find in the New Testament, and there are a lot of those. So I think to, to that degree it's understandable, but I just don't think they deal well exegetically with a lot of the texts about hell. And I, I think you have a hard time making, making the case. Um, so the Augsburg Confession does confess the existence of hell. Right? If, you're, if you're going to be a confessional Lutheran and affirm the Augsburg Confession, hell does exist and it is eternal. It makes no claim about how many people are going to end up there or anything like that, but eternal punishment and eternal judgment does, does exist according to the Augsburg Confession. Um, so that, that's part of our confession of faith here. There are some who say that, you know, that, that call themselves kind of hopeful universalists. Well, hell is forever. Maybe nobody will really end up there. Maybe it's just going to be the devil. So maybe, you know, and like, I get it. Like, I get why you come to that conclusion. Uh, um, and I get why you desire it. I just don't think you could, I, I don't think it's exegetically plausible to come to the conclusion that like, nobody's really, hell is just going to be empty. I, I have a hard time with that. And it's one of these things that like, I, I wish I, I kind of wish I was wrong. I mean, in terms of my, my own, um, what I would desire is like, yeah, I would love for everyone to be saved and that sounds great, but I don't get to make these decisions. It's not up to me, right? Like it's, it's not, it's, it's what God says I have to accept. And I know what God does and says is true and good. So I have to trust that what God tells me is good and right. 
and better than what I think might be good. <laughs> so like that that's just where we're left. Okay. Um, then we have, in terms of eschatology, this final part of this that I do want to, I, I think it's important to discuss. It says also, they condemn others who also now scatter Jewish opinions that before the resurrection of the dead, the godly shall occupy the kingdom of the world, the wicked being everywhere suppressed, the saints alone, the pious, shall have a worldly kingdom and shall exterminate all the godless. Okay. Certain Jewish opinions. So what? What is we talk? What are we talking about here? Um, we're talking about the your approach to the millennium. Okay, Kiliasm. And throughout church history, there are essentially three different views of the millennium. We can divide those. There are divisions within those views, but three broad views. Um, on the one hand, we have a premillennialism. And, and okay, we're talking. Just to take a step back for a minute. We're talking about Revelation chapter twenty. So Revelation chapter twenty talks about this thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. So the question is, what does Revelation 20 mean? What is it talking about? The premillennialist says that Christ will return, and after the return of Christ, he will set up this millennial 1,000-year reign. And at the end of that 1,000-year reign, the devil is going to be set free for a time and then finally defeated. So we have a kind of three-stage eschatology. We've got the end of this age, the beginning, then there's the millennial reign, and then there's the consummation. So we've got all, all we've got this millennial reign kind of in between return of Jesus and consummation. So that's the premillennial perspective. I, I, I don't take a premillennial approach. I don't take a premillennial approach for a lot of reasons, but largely because the framework of the text of scripture seems to repeatedly just contrast this age and the age to come and doesn't really leave room for this intermediate millennial um, stage here. Do I understand how Revelation 20 can be read that way? Yeah, absolutely. But Revelation 20 by itself, like if I just had that text, I don't know how sold I would be on any of the interpretations because I think they're all rather plausible, which is why we have the broader hermeneutical principle that scripture interprets scripture and clear passages help us to interpret more obscure passages that aren't we're not quite sure about. So it's that general principle that I would take there. Uh, the other perspective, uh, another perspective would be post-millennialism, which basically says that this thousand year reign, not necessarily a literal thousand years in this approach, um, but that there is a kind of gradual Christianization of the earth and the world will be Christianized for this kind of golden age for a certain period of time and then Christ will return. So that's the post-millennial approach, which generally is uh, is found in the Reformed Church more than anywhere else. I don't really see it other places. And then there is the amillennial approach, which is the general Lutheran approach here, uh, which says that the millennial reign of Christ, there is no distinct millennial period of a kind of, you know, the glorification of the church or something like that, but that Revelation 20 is using that thousand year time frame to speak symbolically about the entire age of the existence of the church, so that we are in the millennium right now. It's not a separate later age. Uh, and so amillennialism tends to be the view of Lutherans. Now, that's also that's the view of people like Augustine, uh, and it becomes the predominant view of the Western Church in the medieval period, and we kind of just inherited that. But uh, the question, there's a question within Lutheran theology and interpretation of the Confessions of what is being condemned here. So this, because this talks about before the resurrection of the dead, and premillennialism has a kind of resurrection then millennium, it, the whole, it, it gets very convoluted, but the, the what's condemned seems to be more explicitly a post-millennial approach. So w what seems to be condemned here is a view that says that the world will essentially be Christianized. We can have purely Christian societies on this earth, which is what the Anabaptists wanted to have and still strive to have. It's a recognition that on this earth, the godly and ungodly will all always be together doesn't mean the kingdom of God won't grow and won't have success and God won't continue to be at work. But we can we should never expect this almost utopian vision of the kingdom of God prior to the return of Christ. And so it's that recognition that really leaves out postmillennialism as an option at all for Lutherans. So Lutherans are not postmillennial. 
the there is a debate then as to whether this also condemns premillennialism, which it kind of seems to, but I can also see how you'd say it doesn't. So there are occasionally Lutheran premillennialists. Um, so Revere Franklin Widener is a Lutheran premillennialist. I think he's dead wrong about it, but <laughs> and I agree with him on most things, but I think he's dead wrong about that issue. But uh, he certainly is a confessional Lutheran, and there is an argument that says that the confessions really don't condemn a premillennialism, but only a postmillennial approach. Um, but the majority of Lutherans uh, would reject both perspectives. We're pretty much all millennial. Uh, you will occasionally find, I know some Lutheran church bodies like the Lutheran Brethren are largely premillennial. I know that the Free Lutheran Church allows premillennialism. As, and, and they believe it's consistent with the Augsburg Confession. Um, of course, those church bodies also have views of you know lay ministry and preaching, which I don't see how they, those are consistent with Augsburg Confession either, but that's a, another topic. Um, so you, you can find them occasionally, uh, premillennial Lutherans, but pretty much amillennial. Okay, well, um, that covers a lot of the basic stuff that I wanted to look at in uh, this article. This is a huge topic because we're talking eschatology and there are so many different elements to this and texts that we could go through. So here's a, this is just a little overview of what's taught here. I'm hoping that it doesn't take me too long to do the next Augsburg Confession series podcast. The problem is these don't get a lot of views. So so part of my job is dependent on this and views that I get. And so I have to like try to do ones that I know will get views and, and intersperse the things that I probably want to be doing more that don't always get as many views. So, um, but I'm hoping it doesn't take me that long to put the next one up. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you do subscribe if you haven't already on YouTube and on your podcast app. We'll see you in the next one. God bless.